You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show where we look at amazing tooling to build your own data science AI models with Python. Make sure you tune in. Hi there, my name is Seth Juarez. Welcome to this episode of the AI Show. We're going to talk about some awesome tooling that you can use as a data scientist and a developer to do AI. Why don't you introduce yourself? We'll start with you, John. Sure. I'm John Lamb. I work on the uh, the Azure Notebooks team, and I'm building the the experience and playing the data scientist as well um, in the first part of this uh, demo. Awesome, Rong. I'm Rong. Uh, I'm a PM on the Python team, and I work on tools in Visual Studio Code for data science jobs. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say I will be playing the developer role in this. Episode. Fantastic. If I interrupt too much, you just slap me because people <laughs> watching want this to happen. So just be liberal. Be entertaining. That's right. So <laughs> here's right. the thing. Sounds good. As Can we slap you? Yes, please. You're supposed right. to slap me the whole time. Okay. So as a data scientist, like how do you, what do people actually do to build AI models? And then what are some things that we can give them to help them with that process? Absolutely. So I think it all starts with a set of tools, right? right? And what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through. Um, uh, uh, training, optimizing, and deploying um, this model that allows us to detect different kinds of dogs and cats, right? Okay. So the idea really is, is there's a picture, what breed is this dog or cat? And we're is it a hot dog or not a hot dog? <laughs> exactly, yes, yes. And uh, so this model is going to be trained using TensorFlow. It's using uh, a technique called transfer learning, where we're taking a model that's already been pre-trained on a whole bunch of different images, and we're just going to retrain the final layer of that model using a set of 37 um, categories of dogs and cats that we have uh, selected. It's a, a data set called the Oxford um, Pet data set. Okay. And uh, we're going to go use a bunch of Azure infrastructure and tooling right, to go, go make that happen. All right, let's do it. Cool, let's go. So what we have is a GitHub repository which contains the files for our demo. Okay. And one of the, the really nice things that we have is this badge um, that you can click on here which has Azure Notebooks and import written on it. So that's going to go take that thing and import it into Azure Notebooks. I've done it already here and this brings us into the Azure Notebooks experience. You can see it's exactly the same set of files um, that we have here. And what we want to do is we want to start um, uh, running one of our notebooks, which will walk us through the training experience. So and people at home can literally click on that button and they will see this happen in their own Azure Notebooks account. If they don't have one, you can create one, it's free. Absolutely, okay. right? And you can log in with uh, both a Microsoft account or if you have a Workplace account, an Azure Active Directory account, you can log in using one of those as well. And I just interrupted you because I want people to start following along because you can follow along and do this live. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So. What I'm going to do now is, uh, again, since this is a deep learning model, right? Uh, this this really helps when you have um, a GPU to help you accelerate the the training process. So a new feature that we launched um, in Azure Notebooks is two things actually. The first part of it is we integrate with your Azure subscription now. So with the Azure subscription um, integration, you can now uh, run. Uh, your compute on arbitrary VM sizes inside of Azure. Oh, cool. Um, so, so what we have now is I've already set up and started a VM. You see here, there's this button here that says run on GPU DSVM. And that starts up a Jupyter Notebook server running on top of one of the Azure. It happens to be an NC6 um, mm -hmm. VM size, if you happen to know that already, um, which contains um, the GPU that we're going to be using. Is there something you have to do on the VM in order to make this work? Or is it just like, it finds it and it does it. So it's literally a kind of like a turnkey experience, right? In the sense that um, you start the, the VM right now in the portal, right? So we don't currently have the experience to start it from within the Azure mm -hmm. Notebooks experience yet, but that's coming. Um, so if you go to the notebook, you start up the VM, it's called a data science VM. So yeah. you search for a Linux data science VM in the portal. And uh, you you fill out all the forms. You start that thing running, and then from Azure Notebooks, what you'll do is you'll either look for the IP address for um, that VM or its um, its DNS name, mm -hmm. or you can also use this uh, built-in drop-down thing, which will enumerate all of the running VMs that are in your subscriptions. Oh wow! And you just pick that one out of the list. So you don't have to provision the VM or do anything. You have to provision in the sense you got to turn it on. First, oh, of course. Right? So we don't have the ability to turn it on, right? But once it's once it's there, we will enumerate all the running VMs that you have in your Azure subscriptions, and you just pick the one that you want to use. I don't have to like install something on the VM for this to work? Nope. It just Because all the stuff, it's kind of batteries included inside this VM. That's cool. Yeah. Love yeah. it. So now that we're in here, we have this, uh, this notebook that's running. 
The very first thing that we typically want to do as a data scientist, let's kind of take a look at what the data looks like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run this cell. And if you haven't seen a Jupyter Notebook before, Jupyter Notebooks are kind of like blogs, right? Except for the fact that um, you can actually run the code inside of the cell. So I can run a couple of different ways. I can click on this Run button up here, or I can hit um, Shift Enter um, while I'm inside of the cell. I'm just going to do that because it's a convenient shortcut. And you can see um, sample pictures, one from each category that I've shown below. Right? So these are the 37 different categories of dogs and cats that we'll be using. I'm going to now run this cell to start the training process. So remember, we talked about this transfer learning idea. So transfer learning is great because we can train just the final layer and against a much smaller set of data, right? Because we're starting with a pre-trained model. Mm -hmm. The model that we're starting with is a, a model uh, called MobileNet. Okay. MobileNet is particularly interesting because it's optimized to run on small devices. It can run on phones and it can also run on this AI camera that we've been showing oh, cool. um, recently at a bunch of different events. So when we look through this thing um, and this data set, we scroll to the bottom here, you can see that we have this test accuracy of about 80%, right, 79.5% here. And the test accuracy is important because when we were training the model, um, there's, there's a set of data we're using in the training, and there's a set of data we're using to validate it, and then there's a set of data we held back, mm -hmm. right, just to see how good is this model at seeing a bunch of pictures that it's never seen before during the training validation step. So that's the thing that we use to evaluate the goodness of the model, and 80% is a pretty impressive result because when this data set first came out back in 2012, the best models in the world that were hand-tuned by AI researchers could only hit 59% accuracy. So in about 25 seconds, 80% accuracy running on Azure. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, when I was in school, I had to rent like the supercomputer to do this kind of stuff, and they will only let me do it like at three, between 3 and 4 a.m. because I was an undergrad grad. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty pathetic. Yeah, that, that's this terrible. Is amazing. Yeah, I know, it's awesome. And now that you're, you, you've got this, we can see if we can do better than 80%, right? So um, now what we're going to do is we, we did all of this training, all this transfer learning thing that we did right now, we did it all using that uh, VM, right? That data science VM running on the GPU connected from the notebook. Um, there's a service that we just um, GA'd just at Connect uh, last week called the Azure Machine Learning um, Service. Mm -hmm. And there's a feature of that service called Hyperdrive. Now, as a data scientist, oftentimes what you do is you want to tune some parameters, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a developer, you know that, hey, I can try different optimization settings in my compiler, right? That's an example of a, a parameter, a hyperparameter, mm -hmm. um, as uh, data scientists like to call it. So we're going to start off by, by doing some hyperparameter tuning. There's a particular parameter in, um, in training these models called the, the learning rate, right. which you can kind of think about as the size of the step that you're taking right, mm -hmm. while you're trying to find the solution. And uh, we're just going to throw random values at this in a random distribution between 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 3. All right, so Love we're going to try different things. Um, and uh, so this is a service. It lives inside of this Azure Machine Learning Service, right? And Azure Machine Learning Service uses a concept called a workspace to organize a bunch of resources that you have. Your compute resources, in this case, I have a cluster that I've already started up, right, which has five nodes, five GPU nodes running um, right now. And it also has a concept of experiments, which kind of shows the different runs that you've taken over time, as well as the data set that we're using is already being provisioned inside of this workspace. Um, so what I did in that first line of code that I just ran was just get, get a reference to an experiment that I've already set up. Um, this line, this uh, chunk of code in here happens to be the code that gets deployed to each node of the cluster. And if you look carefully at these two lines of code up here, you'll see that there's two parameters we essentially pass in on the, param on the command line, right? So the hyperdrive daemon passes in two parameters. One is, hey, this is where the data is stored. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, what's that learning rate that I want this node to run on? All right, so it's really cool. Um, once we have that done, we can switch over to this cell. And what this cell does is a couple of things. It does this um, learning rate thing. So this log uniform distribution is, yeah, I just want random numbers, but, but, but random based on logarithmic units, not sure. on, on non-logarithmic units. And we're going to go deploy this thing out and, run and start this run using the hyperdrive daemon. Now, as this thing is running, we would like to see progress. Um, so we'll fire up this next line of code, which starts showing this, um, this widget. This widget shows you it's some HTML that's running dynamically in there that shows me the status of my cluster and what's going on. This is going to take some time to, to complete, so I'm going to switch to looking at a completed run um, for time. And uh, this completed run I did already um, a, a bit earlier, and you'll see that it's populating um, the runs. So as it's trying each one, the, the experiment that we ran um, 
uh, did 20, tried 20 different random values, would run up to four um, computes in parallel on Holy my cow. five node cluster. And when it's done, what's kind of cool here is it shows all of the, the completed runs and it shows this graph, right, of how that validation error um, uh, or the validation accuracy was improving, right, as the run um, uh, went on. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about what the final result was was that we got about a 90% test accuracy, right? In training, we traded maybe about 20 minutes for this thing to, to, to run on this hyperdrive cluster um, to get an additional 10%, right, which is fantastic. Right? Yeah, so oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, generally what I would do as a data scientist would be like, well, let me try 10 to the minus 5 here and see what happens. And yep. then I run it, and then six minutes later... Yeah. Uh, let me try, you know, and so this is cool because it feels like it's a ginormous for loop going over random mm -hmm. values of these parameters and you don't have to do anything. Yes. Now, is it going to run all of these jobs to completion or is there a way to stop the ones that just stink? Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, uh, question because there's this, it's almost like I paid you to say that. I know. Right? I so, know. so I take checks. So there's this one line of code that's sitting inside of here, right, which is called this, this early termination policy. And what the early termination policy says is if this run is less than is, is less than fifteen percent away, right, um, from the best value that I've seen so far, right? Just go terminate this run um, early, right? So after so many steps, right, we're going to terminate this run, and so that allows me to reclaim that node that was being used on this run that's probably not going to convert, right? Right, and I can replace it with a different value. Uh, and that's awesome, man. And I I, I kind of knew the answer to this beforehand, but it's cool because. Like originally, I could just run a for loop and think I'm a really smart data scientist, looping over random values, log uniform val values. But now I can actually run them and have the jobs killed without having to do anything. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So, so, the, so now that I've got this experiment that's run to completion, um, I can now register uh, the, the best run, right, inside of the model, right? So there's this, um, this best run thing that I'm going to do now, right, which is going to go literally just pull out the best run from that experiment register it inside of the Azure Machine Learning Service mm -hmm. so that I can now give it to Rong, right? So Rong is our developer here, and she's going to help us take this model that I finished training. So remember, I've trained and optimized right. this model now, 90% um, um, test accuracy, and now she's going to deploy it into production. So let's pause for a minute, because maybe there are people that are watching out there that are new to AI. You keep saying this notion of a model. What is a model? So a model you can just think about as a function. Okay. Right? It's a function that took some input and tries to um, generate or make a prediction about what the output is going to be, right? So what we'll see here is um, the input obviously is going to be a picture, right? So it's going to be a picture of, of some animal. And the model is going to say, oh, this is, remember there's these 37 categories that the model knows about. So it knows about these 37 um, different breeds of dogs and cats. And it'll say, oh, I think the likelihood of this thing being, you know, this kind of dog is going to be this percent. Got it. Right, so it's going to, going to give us a rank of the top five yeah. results. That we'll see out. this in action, you know, a little bit. Awesome. So demo. now that the data scientist is done and they've mm -hmm. been overpaid, let's get to right. the actual work. <laughs> <laughs> actual work gets done by developers, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so I, I will do two things here. First, um, so John has trained the model in the notebook, and we want to turn this model, turn this notebook into a Python module, mm -hmm. so we can do more trainings in the future. Let's mm -hmm. say we get more data, we want to retrain, we want to turn that into a piece of software that can be source controlled. Okay. So that would be my first job. And the second job is the model that John has trained and optimized, we're going to deploy that as a service in Azure. And then we'll see how we can use that model as a service in and, an application. And then we become rich, right? So we make a mobile app, obviously, that pings the API, and then we're rich. Yes, right. absolutely. Pretty, pretty excited yep. about this. Uh -huh. All in like 30 minutes. <laughs> yes. All right, now let's get started. Let's do it. So as a developer, I'm going to use my favorite tool to do both jobs. Um, and uh, let's get started with getting the notebook that John had, mm -hmm. right? So the f easiest thing to get that um, is to git clone, because okay. it's already on GitHub, and all I have to do is to run this command in VS Code, right. and uh, give it the URL and download everything. Now, um, I already have that downloaded on my local machine, right here. So the file we are interested in here is this notebook file. And here's the exact challenge I same have. thing. I have a challenge with notebook files primarily because I love working <laughs> with them, but as a dev, they're kind of yeah. Not useful. I end up going over there and copying the code, and then I move uh -huh. it over, and then I have to refactor it because between us, a data scientist doesn't, doesn't write good code. So 
<laughs> but so we have to fix Lots it. Lots of no copying and pasting. No offense. Lots right. of copying and pasting. No, no offense. <laughs> is there a way for me to streamline this? Right. Um, yeah. So the first thing we're, we're going to do is let's take this notebook file and see what it looks like. Okay. If you open this in, straight in VS Code, you get this as a JSON format. Right. But we're going to get a much richer experience in Visual Studio Code using the Python extension. Cool. Notice there's a pop-up message asking me if I want to import this into VS Code as Python code. And I do. So I click on Import, and right there, all the code is extracted from the notebook um, right here. I, I feel like this happened really fast, and people just don't get the gravity <laughs> of this. And I've seen this demo before, and obviously I knew what question to ask, but like, I have spent way too much of my life copying stuff out of a notebook uh -huh. and then moving it over, doing it in one click and doing it in a sensible way and having this little thing that says run cell to me is amazing. Yeah, that hopefully saves a lot of uh, copy and paste right. work. Um, so one thing you'll notice is we have converted all the markdown cells as comments, so you can keep those in your file and the code cells as code. Right. And what's more magic about this conversion is uh, we put these little marks in there. So we keep all your cell structure from the notebook into your code. And once you have those annotations in your code, you'll see this run cell mm -hmm. um, code lenses light up, which means we can run these cells inside VS Code in an interactive way, just like you're working with Jupyter. So let's, so I just clicked on uh, run cell here. Mm -hmm. So what happened was this spins up a Jupyter server on my machine and then gets results back and we present that in this uh, Python interactive window. So this is a markdown cell. If I move down here, I can run a code cell and again, I can use the same shortcut key, shift enter, uh, that John used earlier to run a cell. Oop. Oop. Command enter. Yes. Oops, not command enter. Oh, I didn't realize that didn't work. And it must be something else. Control. It's the max fault. Yeah. We're max. Yeah, we're going to blame it on that. But yeah. me, look, this I This is like these, these LED, huh. like LCD things, the touch bar thing. I bet it's be that. Honestly, I think that just being able to click on, like having it there, hmm. I did a demo with this just recently, and just being able to show, like, here's what happened. I mean, like, oh, let me type this up real quick and run it, and have it all in Visual Studio Code. To me, as a developer, it's kind of like, oh, this is my environment. I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's just try. Click, uh, which which will run this code cell, and now we are looking at these pictures uh, from each breed of dogs and cats that we have seen earlier in the notebook. Right. So you get the similar experience um, in here. So let's take a quick look at this interactive window. This is the newest feature addition in the Python extension for VS Code. Um, so in here, you can not only run um, see the results, but also you could clear results. Say here, or you want you can uh, navigate back to your source code, mm -hmm. right there. So it goes back there. Um, you can restart kernel or interact the kernel, and, and once you're done, you can even export the results back to be a notebook file. Oh, that's cool. So you could start with code first, mm -hmm. and then go to notebook if right. you want. So, so yeah. give it to data scientists and to view the results that's cool. and all that. Um, okay, so let's close that window now. Um, so now I'm ready to start refactoring the code mm -hmm. into a Python module. A um, couple of features that would be really, really handy in this task is, let's say I want to take this chunk of code and put that into a function. I can use extract method right there. Save changes and uh, name it check dataset. And just like that. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Usually, this is pretty fast. Right, it's and like but a second. As I'm looking at this, like <laughs> one of the cool things about this is, like I said, when I'm doing this code, it's nice to be able to take because, look, notebook code is not something I would actually like. It's not that I wouldn't check it in, but I would check it in for other reasons to explore, to annotate, to understand, right? But this code I would actually use to actually 
check into source code, run interactive jobs somewhere else. Right? Yeah, and the, 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 the kind of central idea about why we want to do this, this refactoring here is to turn this thing into a software artifact, right? right. Away from this, this notebook artifact into a software artifact, I can version control it, I can run mm -hmm. it again simply by importing it as a module into some Python script. Mm -hmm. So this could be, this could happen if I wanted to train it on additional breeds of dogs. Right. If I find some more pictures of dogs and cats out there, I'll just right. add it to my, my data set and then we run the model against that. Or you maybe you get it, someone says, hey, it's super important for the business that we start to understand cat breeds too. Then you can start yep. to add more data and then do the training again. Right. We know this works. We can try it again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. In this process, uh, like I mentioned, a couple of other features. Let's just take a quick look. Let's say if I have another piece of code I want to do something with, um, right click, and then I have rename symbol, mm -hmm. change all our currencies. Like if you want to refactor code, in a notebook format, that means you have to look for code um, across different cells, mm -hmm. which is really difficult to find and sure. replace. But this you can do all at once. Um, I can sort my imports, um, and I can even extract variables to make it cleaner. Um, I can use the built-in debugger mm -hmm. right here in VS Code, right here. So all I have to do is click F Click this button, arrow button, or press F5 to start debugging. There's That's no cool. configuration needed if I only want to uh, debug this one single file. And you can hit breakpoints, um, look at variables, and call stack, and everything you expect with a debugger. So all right there. So just to, for the interest of time, um, let's switch over mm -hmm. to finish the version that it kind of refactored a little bit. You can see I have all the imports sorted at the top. I have put code into functions. Yeah, this feels more codey to me. You right. Know? Um, and then I can call these functions, or even from a different module, like John said. Um, and then I can take this file, put this in, uh, under source control, mm -hmm. and then uh, for collaboration, for version control, um, and all that. OK, so, so now I have completed my first task, mm -hmm. which is turn code into a, a Python module. Now let's work on the second one, which is, we're going to uh, take the model, the best, the best model we have optimized, and deploy that as a web service on Azure and look at um, how we can do that easily in VS Code. So to do that, I'm going to need an extension called um, Azure Machine Learning mm -hmm. uh, extension. And I already have that installed. Once I have that, um, I can access everything in my uh, Azure Machine Learning service. And this is my workspace right here, my subscription. And what we're going to see is um, the model that John has registered earlier from the Azure Notebooks. Mm -hmm. And we can see the same information right here. And this is the model that was deployed, uh, uh, that was registered. And to deploy, I simply just have to right click and select this menu item. That says deploy service that's from cool. this model. And that's all I need to do. Um, of course, along the way, um, it's going to ask me for a file, a script file, what we call a score file. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, this is a file that's required by Azure Machine Learning Service to define, hey, the, all the raw data coming into the web service, how am I, am I going to process the data? And how I am going to use the model to make predictions? And this is defined in this run function. So just to be clear, because I, I, I mean, this, this is really cool. But what, what are we actually deploying? Are we deploying like a web service or some kind of API service? This is a web service. Cool. So the web service then, you have to have this file that takes an input and then you have to load this model up, right. pass in the things, and then make sense of what the output right. is. Right. Essentially, this is what this, uh, this script file defines cool. in this run uh, function. It takes in my input, which is um, my raw data in JSON format, mm -hmm. convert that into a JPEG image, because mm -hmm. that's what our model takes in as input. Um, so I'm using TensorFlow here to do the conversion cool. into image, but I'm not quite done yet. What I'm going to do here is add one uh, line of code real quick. Say I want to resize all the images coming so I know what size it's going to mm -hmm. be. So I'm going to use uh, continue to use, use TensorFlow uh, you notice, as soon as I type in tens, uh, TF, I get my regular IntelliSense along with the document information on the right side. Sure. Um, and then what's cooler is in here, if I type in dot, not only I get regular IntelliSense, but I also get notice all the top five 
start results. Right. This is coming from a feature called IntelliCode, which is our AI-assisted intelligence. Um, essentially, so we're we, using like AI, AI to, to our, build AI. Yeah, um, which is nice. So we trained uh, this engine with open source projects um, that has used uh, TensorFlow, and we know in this context, these are the uh, functions you're you're probably gonna need and probably what you should use. Um, so right here, I'm gonna use image, which is in the list. I'm gonna tap and dot again. You see, we get a different list That's to cool. start result. And just so happened, I need just need the first one because mm -hmm. I should just do what intelligence tell yeah, me to do. Basically. I don't know um, why we even have jobs anymore. That's right, right. Just, just, just dot tab, dot, dot tab. tab. Boom, that's all. Um, and then I'm going to pass in uh, the result from the previous step and just give it a uh, size. And this is because the model expects a specific size. Exactly. As it comes in. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, down here, we're going to start this TensorFlow session and run. Um, and then here is where we load this model. Mm -hmm. Um, we uh, we look at the uh, labels, the output labels, and compare the species, uh, make predictions, and return the top k results, right. which we're going to see in our test app. All right, so this is a, this is how we define how the service is going to work. Of course, coming back here, we're going to deploy the model, supply this this file along with environment file that defines the dependencies we need. Mm -hmm. Like in, in like this case, flow. we're going to need TensorFlow. Yes. Um, but that's all we yep. need. And um, it only takes a couple of minutes mm -hmm. to get that deployed. Um, but again, for the sake of time, let's just look at one that's already deployed as okay. a web service. And I can prove that to you by showing you the service properties. So is this, where is this putting it? Is it putting it like in a VM? Is it some kind of something? Because I know it feels like you're building containers somehow mm -hmm. because right. you're giving environments and yep. stuff. Where are these containers going when you deploy them? Where can so you put them? This is um, in this particular case, we're using Azure Container Service, okay. uh, Container Instances, okay. which is single container that Azure spins up for you really, really quick. Mm -hmm. um, especially great for testing purposes because it's it will spin up really fast in seconds, right. and then will be tear, tear down once it's done. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when you are more ready for production, you can use Kubernetes, okay. which is going to spin up a cluster mm -hmm. of container instances, um, and the scales really, really well. Um, but in this particular case, everything is running a container that Azure spins up for me. I don't have to do anything. It right. happens automatically behind the scenes. That's cool. And that's all managed by the Azure Machine Learning Service. Um, so here, we have our web service. Um, this is the URL we're going to use. And now let's go back to our code file. And I have a test application here. Um, so we're going to test out if our model works. Uh, so this is another Python file, but this service can be used by whatever language mm -hmm. of your choice, right? Any kind of applications. Um, so what are we going to do here? This is a really simple application. We're going to take an image. In this case, it's a dog, yeah. an image that has a dog. And this is the service we're going to use, the same service URL we have seen. Um, and essentially, it's going to do, um, when it comes in, we turn the image into JSON and send that information over as an HTTP request to the web service, this uh, these code. Mm -hmm. And then when the result comes back, we unpack the result and uh, um, try to see what the predictions are. And um, so this piece of code, I can run this in a regular Python terminal. You know, we can see what yeah, the see numbers what uh, look like. But I'm going to do something even better. Remember, we looked at the interactive window earlier? Yes. And I'm going to just type in pound percent percent to turn this code, entire piece of code, into one single cell. And what's cool about this is now I can run the cell in this interactive window. Uh -huh. Um, so I can view the results not only as text, but also as an image. Because I sent an image over to the web service. I want to see what the image looks like. That's cool. And in here, I can see both. And this is the image I sent. This is the prediction results that I got back. So you see, this is likely an English Cocker Spaniel uh -huh. with 98% probability. Uh, very likely. This is the, the breed. Um, some other guesses, the top the other top four guesses, but much, much, much smaller, smaller numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we kind of walk through how we turn 
a notebook file into a Python module, how we deploy models, and how we can use the service to actually make predictions. And this is real. This is pretty cool. I mean, this yeah. is a real thing. It's a mm -hmm. real service. Now, the thing is, just to summarize, because I feel like we went through stuff really fast, you actually train a model. Yep. Optimize the hyperparameters so that you get a better, not just, I think it was 75, 80% accuracy, you went 95% accuracy? 90% accuracy. 90% 90 90 accuracy. Then once you're done with all the experimentation, you're like, all right, here, developer. And what you do is you take the Python, you take the Python import. The Jupyter Notebook, mm -hmm. import, refactor, get it ready to push out again so that if anyone wants to run the experiment again, they can. And then you deploy that service using the model that you Upload it, and then we're off to the races after that. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it. exactly. That's pretty amazing. So just to finish up, where can people go to find out more about Azure Notebooks? So you go to uh, uh, notebooks.azure.com is, uh, is the site. And uh, all you need to do to sign in is have a Microsoft account or mm -hmm. uh, a Workplace account like an Azure Active Directory account. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And where mm -hmm. can people go to find out about this cool extension, these cool extensions? Is right. it all just one extension? Well, it's actually two extensions. Okay. Um, so there's the Python extension okay. that has the Python interactive experience for data science. And the other extension is Azure Machine Learning extension. Okay. That is for anything you want to use Azure Machine Learning service for. Awesome. And you can just download those and play mm -hmm. with them today for free. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with us. Thanks so much for watching. We're learning all about the amazing tooling we have on Azure to do machine learning, not just Visual Studio Code, but Azure Notebooks. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care.